This is the Reimagining Mathematics Education webinar series. If you didn't sign up for it, it's going to be great anyway, so don't go anywhere else. And in this series, we're connecting math, community, and culture. This series is an exciting endeavor, and I want to thank Cynthia Nickel for just jumping on board and saying, sure, let's try something. And we'll talk about all our partners on the next slide. But um, when we started to think about what this could be and what we could offer, there's a chance to come together um, across the province and beyond to think about um, place in mathematics. And Indigenous story work was so honored to be working with Joanne Archibald in this work. And um, if you didn't get a chance to see session two, it focuses on um, Indigenous story work through math education. And today we're looking at math through social justice, and the topic for session four has been revealed. I didn't even know the topic. It's culturally responsive math assessment, which um, really came up in session one and two as an area that folks want to explore. On our next slide, you will see, oh, no, on the next slide, I will offer my territory acknowledgement. Maybe we'll go back one slide for a moment then, and I'll just talk about the partners. So our partners in this endeavor include the Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center, and that's a new UBC center. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, and so we're, um, we're so delighted to be working with the Lando Center. Um, the Indigenous Math Network that's co-led by Cynthia and Dr. Archibald. Um, so wonderful that we've been learning. And you'll hear more about that beautiful image as we go further into today's session. Um, Cynthia has a research chair, it's the David Robitaille, um, mathematics and science research chair. There must be education in there some, somewhere, Cynthia. And so um, with her research chair and myself, um, I, have, I have the Ricks chair in rural teacher education. This is a partnership with um, our two areas, as well as with Dogwood 25. We have support from the BC Ministry of Education and in partnership with the Rural Education Advisory. So we're a collective um, creating knowledge together. And we're so, we just want to focus and we'll introduce our participants in a moment, but really it's the voices of educators and particularly teachers that we're so happy to share. Thanks to our slightly nervous co-presenters today who will be amazing. We rehearsed last night. And now I'd like to talk about where I'm joining you from. Um, I am just so honored and humbled to be joining you from Silk's territory. Um, I'm a guest here, I'm a settler guest here, and I've been so fortunate to work yeah, with already. the Penticton Indian Band and Elders and Knowledge Keepers for eight, nine years now, um, learning, and I learn each time I hear a new story and um, spend time on the land and, and to be able to learn from the land and with the land and with um, Silks Elders and Knowledge Keepers. Um, I recognize that um, the, Silks have been, the Silks have been here for um, thousands of years, and now that I call this place home, it's my chance to learn from their stewardship and to learn from them. Um, and I acknowledge my um, aspiration to learn more how to act respectful acts of decolonization, um, both in my personal life and my professional life. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that wonderful introduction, Leighton. I really appreciate it. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to be working with you on these, this series and to help co-host this webinar on connecting math, community, and culture. And as uh, Leighton mentioned, this, this particular one is on teaching math for social and ecological justice. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you right now from the traditional unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking people. This was this image was taken in the fall, and this image was taken in the in the winter when we had that cold snap. And you can see the ice on the Fraser River. And where I am is just where the Fraser River splits into the north arm and the south arm. And, um, and, and I've shared before about how just being in this pandemic and being isolated in some ways has really reconnected me to the, to the land and the importance of, uh, of keeping it um, healthy and, and all of the animals and the wildlife that's associated with it. So I really feel my deep connection to that. So uh, we'd like to invite you to introduce yourself and the lands that you are currently on. And you can do that in the chat. You can just type in uh, in the chat who you are and where you're from. Thank you. And it's uh, gr great to see a good group of, of people during this uh, time where we're, we think we're over COVID and then we're, we're back in it again. Um, okay. 
So I want to introduce our uh, group that we're going to be sharing a little bit of the work and my colleagues who um, have helped organize this. We have Jessica Bella from Trail, um, Mahima Lamba from Tawasan, Carol Bogg from Hazleton, Cassie Dustel from Terrace. I think, sorry, Cassie, I think it's Dusdell. Um, Debbie Canote, oh. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> from Port Coquitlam. And you've met Leighton. Uh, Joanne Archibald from UBC, Janice Novakowski from School District 38 in Richmond, and also UBC, and me. Um, so we'll be taking you through uh, thinking about uh, math and social uh, justice. So you, um, you might think, or may have thought, and I'm not sure how, what drew you to our session today, but you might have thought about, you know, what does math have to do with social and ecological justice? And um, and you think, you know, it's really been a crazy two years with this global pandemic, a pandemic that's taught us many things, including the importance of family and the challenges of social distancing, of uh, learning, uh, mental and physical and spiritual well-being. And also a pandemic has taught us about loss and uh, resiliency. And it's also magnified that, you know, not everybody, the human and the more than human are treated equally. And it's trying to understand and act on these inequities that teaching math or social justice can contribute. So here, um, you'll see here the 17 sustainable development goals that were adopted by the United Nations member countries in 2015. So we could ask ourselves, you know, like what role can math education play in ending poverty? What role can it play in working towards responsible consumption? What role can math education play in making sure that all children have access to quality education and addressing issues of climate change, as well as understanding um, global and local experiences of this pandemic? So let's just start by uh, taking a look um, at this graph. So this is a uh, graph of uh, COVID-19 vaccine doses that are administered uh, per 100 people. Um, from December 2nd, 2020 to January 18th, yesterday, 2022. So that means that these are the doses per 100. So if you take a group of 100 people and it, let's say each of those 100 people has three doses, um, then the number would be 300. So we're talking doses, not just people. And we'll just look at it across time. I don't know if you remember the vaccine came out about mid-December of 2020. Um, so you can see at the bottom of this graph where it says no data is the gray. And then you can see the, the scale at the bottom goes from zero um, up to, well, you can see 260, which would be at the end of that would be 300. So if we move this along, this is actually animated. So if I push the play button, it will take us through what the changes from December 2020 to the current. But I'm just going to speed it up and just take us along that real quick light. So you can see here, just watch what happens. And just notice which countries are getting greener and darker and darker green and which countries aren't. And notice also maybe uh, which countries are still gray. And what does that mean? And why? So this is from our world in data. And you can actually go in and actually see, you know, which, uh, what, what country is what and what its numbers are at a particular time um, and adjust that for that. But you can see here, we have no uh, data for the Sudan, uh, for Gabon, uh, for the Congo over here, for Western Sahara. And we could ask ourselves, you know, what, what areas are getting counted and what areas aren't? And so what's being included and what isn't? And then what can we do with this? You know, what does it mean to be able to see this data laid out the way it is. Um, and maybe, maybe this one is also another good example. I mean, you could put in the chat too, some other questions that, that this graph raises for you. And we can sort of start the conversation going there too. Here is another one that has a little slider at the bottom that can take us from December 1st, 2020 to 2022. Cause we could look at the same data um, that went across uh, thinking about vaccine doses per 100 people, but then look at it by income group. And you can see that the higher your income, um, the more 
more quickly you've got your dose and the more people who are at the higher income have the dose as well or have multiple doses. You can see the spread between the lower and the lowest and that there's still a big gap between high and upper and low and lower um, income. But you can also see how, how that can change across time. So I'll just kind of quickly do this one as well. Um, here you can see high income and then the upper middle is starting at end of December of 2020 of people getting their doses. Um, but you can see how the high was high income people have just very quickly had their dose. Upper income is getting very close to the high income. And then you can see how it ends there. But this kind of graph can raise um, lots of questions about you know, why, there, why there is some data for some countries, why there isn't data for other countries, why rich countries or high income people get doses more quickly than less developed countries or lower income. So mathematics can help us describe, uh, measure, um, think about how to count, compare, to model um, in order to help interpret what we're experiencing in the world around us. So um, just going back to our, our slides here, um, another area that we can use to try to help us think about um, teaching math for social justice is, is around the area of uh, climate change. And um, thinking about the IPPCs, um, which is the Intergenerational Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for, for the year 2020, recorded that the year 2020 was the warmest on record and that the global um, average surface temperature of the earth has actually increased by one degrees since 1900s or so. Um, and that might seem like a small amount, but it's actually quite a large amount when you think about how, how much energy and capacity and heat you would need to heat the surface of the temperature one more degree when you have much of the earth being made of ocean. But that extra heat has led to extreme uh, weather, regional temperatures, extreme cold, extreme heat, extreme flooding, both globally, um, as we can see here um, in this image, um, and also locally in thinking about uh, what we've experienced in the Sumas Prairie area with flooding, um, and also on in the Vancouver Island area. This was taken by my colleague in Vancouver Island. Um, and looking at um, forest fires in central BC. So all of this, these changes have, have laid out, you know, a mapping of, of people dying from this, people losing um, their economic livelihoods as a result of this. So it, it's affecting some people more than others and something that we need to be thinking about in terms of how we can be able to address that and be able to think about um, our response to that. So, um, one other really cool thing I wanted to show you um, is also thinking oh this yeah thinking about how um, uh, mapping um, or, or how the changes in heat and temperature have played out across the lower mainland in terms of more wealthy areas staying cooler and uh, less high income areas staying hotter and not being able to get the coolness that they would need as if you were staying in a wealthier area so the wealthy stay cool the uh, less wealthy uh, because there's fewer trees and parks and those areas are actually experiencing the extreme heat differently than if you were in living in more wealthy areas. Um, and then finally, I want to share this. I don't have time to actually play this for you, but um, we could put the link in the chat. But this is a, a sound gram of uh, the sounds of a forest just outside San Francisco uh, from 2004 to 2015. And so this is like the sound of climate change. So it gives you every 15 seconds what the sound of this forest was in 2004. And then after a, a severe drought, how that actually changed the sound of the forest, how you hear this cacophony of birds and animals in the forest and then how the next few years you, that just dies off until 2015, you hear, home, you hear almost nothing. And it's not that the birds and animals aren't there, it's more that um, they just aren't singing. So these are um, things that we can be thinking about, um, trying to think about how mathematics could help us interpret and make sense of what is happening in the world. But also not just thinking about how to interpret, but to think about how to change it. So what uh, Eric Gutstein following um, educational philosopher, Paulo Freire uh, talks about 
reading and writing the world with mathematics? How can we read the world, trying to better understand it and make sense of it, but also how can we write it? How can we write it like W-R-I-T-E to try to change it and make it better? And all st students, and uh, we should include ourselves in that, can participate in that. Think about what's happening across the world in terms of looking at students marching for climate change um, and what's happening in that regard and how youth can get involved. And then also think about uh, Dr. Cindy Blackstock, uh, who um, talks about if you are trying to think about just doing action related to responses of social justice only at the youth level, then we're, we're too late in the cycle. We need to actually start with uh, daycare. And Dr. Cindy Blackstock is a member of the Gitsan First Nation and she's executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. So um, some you know, powerful words here. Um, so in the presentations that follow, uh, we have teachers from kindergarten up to at elementary up to high school who are going to share some highlights about their work and ideas for uh, changing and thinking about teaching math for social justice and ecological justice. And we're going to start with Jessica Bella with her sharing on understanding homelessness. So Jessica. Hi everyone. I am a high school teacher in the small town of Trail. Um, and so my project that I did with my grade eights is called Understanding Homelessness. I wanted to explore current issues within my small community. So I chose to focus on homelessness, um, but I also broadened it to compare national, provincial and um, local information. Um, so through this project, I collaborated with various community members that work within the outreach and shelter support and services. Um, I gained lots of information and insight from these people, as well as resources that they shared with me. So in the actual lesson and project, I used statements regarding misconceptions around homelessness to guide the data collected and shared, which students then made sense of and analyzed using mathematics. And that informed their current understanding on the issue. And they're able to view the social justice topic through a mathematical lens and using different perspectives. So I have a video and in the video, you'll see a glimpse of my lessons and hear audio dispersed throughout from a photo voice project that was previously done in the community. And the reason I included this to show my class um, was to make sure that I was including the voices from those who have experienced homelessness and get those firsthand um, inputs and to bring emotion into the project with my students. So Cynthia, you can just go to the video, hopefully the audio. Yeah, yeah I'm just gonna check that for a sec. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, share again because I don't think I put the share sound button on. So let me just do that. I think we're good now. Okay. You can hear okay? This is a picture um, just to, to show the love that I have for trail. Um, I've lived here ever since I was young, off and on, but when I'm away and I think of trail, this is, this is what I think of. I took these pictures of the shelter because it's a place that I and a lot of my friends hang around in a lot, and we see a lot of judgment. You know, it's almost like people driving past the zoo and they want to go see what's going on at the zoo, right? You know, so really they don't know the whole story, and they, it doesn't really seem like they care to know the whole story. place I used to come when I was a child. We used to play hockey here. Every time I go inside the arena, I can still picture what it was like when I was a kid. Got a lot of good memories there, but yeah, it takes me. And never thought that I would ever be homeless addicted to fentanyl and lose everything that has ever met.
So that video was a really quick glimpse of all of the lessons um, and activities and tasks that I did with my students. Um, they ended up volunteering. I think with social justice and mathematics, it's important for students to um, develop kind of action plans that they want to um, take after learning and seeing these social justice issues through different lenses. So um, with the with COVID and the the things that we were um, able to do, they ended up volunteering at a local hockey game where community members donated brand new toque socks and gloves. And they collected these and sorted them. And then we delivered them to various organizations around the community. And we also created Christmas cards with some personal messages inside for the people that use a homeless shelter to open on Christmas day. And then on the next slide, I have a framework that I developed and used throughout this project. And I think it's a good starting point and gives you things to consider if you're looking for ways to incorporate social justice within mathematics. And later we'll have some breakout rooms that we can go a little bit deeper into some of these projects that we'll be sharing. Um, but this is the one that I developed and used throughout my project. Um, so then it's obvious to me and hopefully by the end of this um, session that incorporating social justice in mathematics can be done at any grade at any level. Um, my example was used with grade eights with possible extensions to more senior level classes in high school. Uh, and next you're gonna see Mahima who's going to share a task that she did with her kindergarten and grade one split class. Thank you. Hi everyone, I was wanting to talk to you all about um, something that spread in my school, something that spread in my school really contagiously. Um, it was actually an idea. So a colleague and I, we realized both our classes had been really interested in accessibility. And I at first didn't really know where the idea from my class was coming from, but I discovered the magical connection was a little girl in my class who had an older brother in the grade six, seven class. And uh, th these siblings had really big hearts and they both were super interested in accessibility. I came to find out that their grandfather is a local accessibility act advocate and activist. And the older students at my school were going on a lot of walks, which was really capturing the attention of my students that they were going out so much, almost as much as we were, or maybe even a little bit more. And they were going all around the town to see what areas of our community were accessible and what barriers there were to people using different mobility devices in our community to get around. So my class also became really interested in this and wanted to try it out. And we got interested in the more surrounding area of our school, like the dog park nearby, the sidewalk, even our hallways. So when we looked really locally, we looked at the closest streets to our schools and we went on a walk with a wagon to see what it would be like to get through some of these areas for somebody who maybe moved around in a different way than we did. On one of our first walks, we saw something that right away captured our attention right at the front door of the school. The little learners were fascinated by the big parking spot and they wanted to know a lot about it. They had so many questions about the really big parking spot. Why is it so big? Who parks here? And more importantly, Miss Lamba, why do you not park your car here? This is the biggest spot. It's right by the door. I decided to follow my students' lead and just look at this idea a tiny bit further. We wanted to know how many kids could maybe fit inside the really big parking spot. All of the kindergarteners, all of the kindergarteners and the grade ones, all of the kindergarteners and the grade ones and the grade twos. Both division 11 and nine could fit inside the parking spot. And we were really amazed to see how many kids could just be inside that area and to use our bodies to kind of measure um, the space. We wanted to know how many steps wide and how long was the spot and also how many cubes. One really interesting thing we noticed about the big parking spot was that there was really only one. We walked through the whole parking lot and we counted all the available spots. We had 40 parking spots at our school, but only one accessible spot. 
this was a way that we looked at power and privilege in a really tangible way using a mathematical lens that was accessible to us, counting and comparing those numbers. We learned a lot about accessible spots and the little girl in my class said, for an accessible spot, it's gotta be big because my grandpa can't just jump out of the car. He needs room for his ramp. Another really important feature we learned about the spot is its closeness to the door. So this was like kind of an exploration of spatial justice for us. We really examined the power and privilege and about, you know, just coming to work or coming to the school and parking and, and being included in the space. So while counting the spots, we came across an area that we thought, what if this could be another accessible entrance to our school? Once we really had a good understanding of the parking spot, we were able to really look at the parking lot and solve the problems using our mathematical lens. The feeling of injustice for the students was really visceral. They were really agitated and ready to mobilize. They wanted to tell the principal right away about the injustice, and they asked me to write a note to him. They wanted to challenge an appeal to who they thought was in power. So I took out my pen and I wrote down at their request um, what they asked. They said, Beach Grove Elementary needs a new parking spot, an accessible one. And they signed it, love Miss Lamba's class. At the end, near the door, at the back of the school, it needs to be 204 cubes or 18 steps wide and 299 cubes or 23 steps on the side. That really did not satisfy the learners in the way I thought it would. We gave the note, but the next day when the parking spot wasn't there, that wasn't really the immediate justice they wanted. So we got our supplies ready. We got our paints. We got our loudspeaker. We got our cubes. We got our supplies ready. And we talked about how what we were doing was not about breaking the rules. We needed to show other people that our idea was possible and that we could do it. So we went outside and we painted the spot ourselves. We took out the we took out our um, paints. We got it done. Other classes came to see what we were doing, and we told the school principal all about it. He wrote to the school board, and he's in discussion with them right now about the possibility of our school having one more accessible spot. So that is just a little bit of um, the story of how my students got interested and how they took action um, for accessibility in our community. Sorry, Mahima, this slide has got one on top of another, so it's a little hard to read it. So maybe we'll fix that one and then we can show people after afterwards. I um, I could fix it, but then I'll have to stop sharing to do that. And sure, I, yeah, I we can look at it later. It's just an image of our supplies okay. and the note I wrote. Yeah. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, both uh, Jessica and Mahima for sharing, both a high school and a kindergarten grade one level. So we thought now what we could do is move into some breakout rooms with some questions that we have posed back here. Um, that could just be ones to get us talking um, or thinking about, you know, obligation. What's our obligation to think about teaching math for social justice? How do we balance social justice and math issues? You know, is there something we need to think about there in terms of covering content? Um, how do we decide on issues to um, engage our students with? What's appropriate for kindergarten versus high school or elementary? And then maybe what kinds of actions or change um, could we think about? But these ones just are possibilities. You may have your own um, that we can get, kind of get us started with. So we thought we'd go into some breakout rooms now. We have uh, 30 or 40 people. So maybe if we were to make breakout rooms, make maybe five random breakout rooms, um, then we'll have some facilitators in each of those rooms. Some of the presenters will be in those rooms so that you can ask questions of the presenters and the presenters can share a little bit more about uh, their projects. So we can do that for the next 10 minutes or so. And then we'll come back with three more projects and then highlights of three more projects and then wrap up. Welcome back, folks. Beautiful uh, conversation there. Thank you for, for that opportunity. All right, so next um, you're going to hear from my colleague, Carol Bob, and she's going to present to you a little bit about a project on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Council. So Carol's up next. Thanks. Thank you, Mahima. 
Um, so I would just like to start, I'm going to be talking about truth and reconciliation and my part in the calls to action to call 62. I'm not going to read it, but I'm just going to base, um, like many of my colleagues, I didn't feel, I'm Indigenous, I didn't feel I was ready to implement these calls to action within my classroom, especially in a mathematics high school classroom. Um, do I sit around and wait for the government to do this as uh, we call upon the federal provincial. No, I'm not going to sit around and wait because then it's going to be another situation like Jordan River Anderson. So I asked myself, hmm, do I wait for my school district to increase our capacity, provide in-service? And I thought, heck no. I have my background in science. I have my background in education. I can do this. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this summer, even though I was aware of the call to action 62, I never actually sat down and read it. So this time I sat down and I came across Senator Mary, Murray Sinclair. And in this video, which I'm not going to show because I have three minutes, uh, he says, pick one of the calls to action and just make it happen. And I still ask myself, oh, next slide, please. I still asked myself, well, how can I make it happen? And then I thought about little deductium. I love deductium. I cried probably the first 20 times I saw this video. Though for those that are not familiar with it, this story is orig originates from Peru. And I think I'm talking too fast. Am I talking too fast? I'm nervous, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this story originates in Peru. And this version is from the Haida Gwaii people. And it's about a little hummingbird um, and some forest critters in the forest. There's a forest fires and all the creatures flee the forest fire except for Deductium. Deductium is this beautiful little hummingbird who swim, uh, flies back and forth with a drop of water to put out the fire in the forest. And finally, Bear has enough and he says, Deductium, what are you doing? And Deductium says, I'm doing the best that I can. So I don't know how many times I think about this video. I just love it. So I thought about Deductium. I said, well, I can do the best that I can. And how can I do that? Uh, next slide, please. Because when we're talking about ecological and social justice and mathematics, it doesn't have to, or and the calls to action 64, it doesn't always have to be about residential schools. So I focus on the history and um, just bringing about awareness in particular, I'm very fond of the non-human mother earth. Um, here, Sorry, my dog's whipping his tail on me. Um, here I created a website for teach educators that are feeling like deductium and they want to do that the best that they can. So I am an, currently, um, I'm on a leave, so I don't have kids to practice these on. But I did want a set of tools that I can have at the ready based on what my kids' interests are, what, um, what inspires them. I live and work in the heart of uh, Delgamook territory where there's lots of missing, murdered indigenous women, um, controversy on the pipelines. I am myself, I'm not ready for that, but if the kids want to delve into that, we will, but I will give them that option when I return to classroom teaching. But for now, with this website, I just have a handful of tools. Um, if you could please go to resources, if you could please click on resource in my website. Oh, thank you. Is that what you want, Carol? Yeah, and then I just wanna, thank you, Cynthia. I just wanted to raise the awareness down at the bottom. I have tabs here. So links to the lesson resources, please. At the bottom, there's a tab, links to lessons resources. Yeah, there. So in our breakout room with Jessica and myself, there's a few teacher candidates that are really interested in climate change and um, territory. So if you can scroll down to the M, I think it's mentors, indigenous mentors. If you can scroll down to the M's, please. So here on this, throughout 
these resources. I have them curated by justice theme, grade, suggested lesson resource, uh, keep going down please, summary, and then the actual link. So here, oh, a little bit, right there. I don't know, Tia would, anyways, these want Tia, Takaya, yeah. I don't know how to say their names, but they're indigenous youth that have been active, um, ad advocates for the climate, environment, and racism. They're big on TikTok and they, so it's a great way to start with social justice in the classroom to possibly engage children or youth. Um, thank you, I think my three minutes is up. Where we're, th we're on this, is that Carol, did I miss it? Um, There's a bit well, of a you, lag between, uh, okay. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> uh, it's up under the M's, okay, one more up. Okay, sorry, there's just a bit of a lag in uh, what you see and what I'm doing. Yeah, so oh, here, oh, um, Tia right Wood, here, yeah. mentors indigenous youth. Yeah, yeah. so there's okay. links. If people scroll to the right, they'll see the links to these people. Yeah, excellent, good. Thank you very much, Carol. Thank you. Lots of good resources and there on this website. Yeah, I could keep going, but I, I think my three minutes is up. So I'd <laughs> like to introduce my amazing um, colleague. Uh, Cassie, she's upstream of the Skeena. Awesome, oh, thanks Cassie. so much. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My project surrounds the Skeena watershed and the effects of climate change. So I would like to acknowledge that I am presenting today from the traditional territory of the Simshan people here in Terrace, BC. Uh, which is located in the southern portion of the Skeena watershed. I've always loved to be in the wilderness, though I'm not much of a hunter or a fisher or really even a hiker, uh, but I've just always loved to be in nature here. And I have wanted to bring the watershed into my classroom since I saw the love and passion that students had for the earth through the Up Your Watershed concert. And actually I'm wearing the t-shirt right now underneath here, but uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna start taking off clothes. So uh, <laughs> it was part of the Voices of Nature program, this, this concert, which brings schools together with an eco justice rock band to learn about the environment through music. Uh, as you can see, these kids were fired right up and so was I. So fast forward three years now, and I have partnered with Christine Slants, who is the education coordinator of the Skeena Wild Conservation Trust here in Terrace, to create a series of lessons and resources with a teaching math for uh, ecological and social justice lens. So why? What's happening? Well, two words, climate change. This here is the final part of a slow reveal graph from the first lesson. Uh, which shows a very slight increase in temperature in Terrace from 1955 to 2020, which is about like 1.1 degrees, which is what Cynthia had mentioned earlier. And like Cynthia said, so what? That seems really tiny, but this tiny increase in temperature is leading to increased drought, reduced snowpack in the mountains, uh, increased prevalence of pests like mountain pine beetle and a higher risk of forest fires. Um, and these together lead to less water running through our streams and rivers, uh, warmer water temperatures, and murky, turbid water from soil erosion and increased uh, stream runoff. And these factors drastically affect the salmon, um, the lives of salmon, affecting whether adult salmon can even avoid predators, whether they can stay healthy and reproduce, and whether eggs and young salmon can even survive in the first place. And the ocean is a whole other ball game. Um, so the salmon are stressed and they're a keystone species. And for one, they eat a lot of bugs. And without them, these populations could have the potential to boom, which we would really not love, I'm sure. Um, they're also an important food source for many animals uh, on land, in the ocean, and high, flying high in the sky. These animals then bring the salmon carcasses onto land, which then decompose and bring life to the soil and the forest. And then we as humans are also tied to the salmon as part of our culture, employment, recreation. 
So what next? So from here, um, these lessons that I created will be piloted with my class, and then we can tweak anything that needs to be tweaked uh, before they're actually used by Christine in Terrace in the surrounding area. And I hope to be able to develop these lessons into a larger unit in the future as well. Uh, my goal is to continue to cultivate a relationship between my students and the watershed, starting with yearly monitoring and analysis and moving to larger student-driven eco-justice projects. And thank you for listening. And up next is the flyest secondary teacher in Port, Port Coquitlam, Debbie Kenoki. And she is here to tell us all about TikTok, social justice, and math. Thank you, Cassie. <laughs> I wish my students were as excited as you were to come and see me. <laughs> it's uh, so my uh, first of all, welcome to my math talk through TikTok. Um, this project was inspired by my goal to further develop an understanding of the relationship between math and social justice issues that were happening in our world right now. And I do teach high school. Um, primarily grade 10 through 12, but I have taught eight and nine at our school as well. And the same thing that I'm seeing all the time is students very engaged with social media. And I was trying to find a way of connecting with students so that they could understand that math has value and it's not just something that you memorize uh, for the next test and then forget about it until you have to learn the next step of it. So I noticed that students were inspired and motivated. Um, they want to make change in the world, but they weren't making a connection between is being seen and being used to make claims or support even it, as a way of simplifying a really complicated issue. So my goal was to make math relevant and to make it relatable so students don't continue to ask the question, when am I ever going to use this? And uh, rather that they can use the math to be critical of the information that's being presented to them. So then this led me to TikTok. And the thing is, we are all bombarded with images so many times throughout the day, and a lot of it is coming through social media. So I chose TikTok specifically because it is a very popular social media platform, and it enables uh, all users to share information in short, engaging videos. And it was an easy way of meeting students where they're at. So the ease of use, the potential for wide viewership and the opportunity to tag with other similar videos um, made this a really power or makes this a very powerful tool at getting a message across. So in this particular series, what I did was create five TikToks that are used to introduce a topic and then I also made a manual, which this is the magazine cover, or the manual cover, to help educators start exploring the integration of math and social justice topics. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the framework that I used to develop these, all of the, the um, TikToks. The idea was that the math was shared through engaging visuals and evidence. And this could include graphs, charts, numbers, percentages, like anything that was number related so that students could understand that math really is all around us. The social justice topics were made relevant through storytelling, music, images, whatever was um, something that was engaging and that would catch their attention immediately. And then the emotional connection was trying to understand or having them understand why this mattered. And so it was really important to understand that there's so many issues out there that it can be quite overwhelming. So connecting the math and social justice issues wasn't designed so that we fit a social justice issue into a particular math lesson or fitting math into a particular topic. Instead, these connections occur organically and they occur over time so that the math is learned over several lessons or several units and it's all at once. It's not done in isolation. So at the same time, a social justice issue can be studied throughout the entire course um, because you don't want to be superficial in terms of addressing a particular topic. Like it really does deserve um, all of us to be getting in 
So I'll yeah. just keep talking. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next slide that I can't see, but I'm hoping you guys can. Um, basically, it's a filmed, one of my filmed TikToks. And it has also the resource that goes with it. And you're going to notice that the questions themselves are very broad. And they're not age specific. And because they're meant to encourage both teachers and students to learn together. And the activities are, are starting points and can be adjusted based on your own class composition because every class is um, unique. So we need to be aware of what issues may or may not be appropriate. One of the most important things before we uh, look at the video as I'm here shouting in my video, it looks like, is that um, implementation of this takes time and it's best to focus on only one topic or unit and to start young. The younger you start, the better, as we saw even from Mahima's uh, presentation. Every student can benefit from developing their understanding of the connections between math and social justice. Um, so I think I'll stop shouting and you can press play. <laughs> Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Kenoki here and welcome back to Math Talk through TikTok. Today we are looking at the math behind consumerism and the environment. We live in a disposable world, diapers, coffee cups, clothing, appliances, and on and on. Businesses don't want to promote longevity because it results in a decline in profits. Consumers feel pressured to keep up with the Joneses. The need to buy more has resulted in increased use of credit. Few things are built to last, but what has this planned obsolescence done to our environment? The pursuit of higher profits in our throwaway society has resulted in unsustainable land, air and water pollution, increased use of plastics contributing to the destruction of marine and wildlife, the transfer of garbage from developed to developing countries, the costs are high, but the damage is even greater. What can be done to deal with this ecological injustice? Thanks, Debbie. Do you, do you have more you want to share with that? No, I timed myself for three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next slide, I think you share a little bit about the framework. So you want to say a bit about that? And then we have a couple of minutes here to kind of have some questions and then wrap up. So oh, I'm going to keep playing if you don't. Hi, stop everyone. Me. <laughs> Thanks. There we go. Um, so over the past year, I've been looking quite a bit into social justice issues and how we can incorporate this into our classrooms. And one of the frameworks that I've been working on since then is how to actually start the process of engaging social justice topics with mathematics. And it, this isn't actually, it doesn't have to be just with mathematics. This really could apply to um, any of our courses. But the first place you need to start is by um, selecting an appropriate theme for your class. Because location, demographics, um, grade level, all of that will play a part in selecting an appropriate theme for the class. We also want to find something that's engaging because I think we've all, or hopefully not everybody, but I think there are times when we've tried pre uh, presenting a lesson to students and it just, although we find it exciting, it just doesn't go well with the student. So we need to find something that they are going to be of interest or of interest to them as well. So that takes us to uh, learning some of the key issues around a particular theme. We are not expected to know everything about a social justice topic. It's just overwhelming. It's too much to try and do that on top of planning our regular week of materials and activities and lessons with our students. When we're looking at this, it's very important to be learning alongside our students. And it's okay to say to our students, I don't know the answer. So why don't we find this out together? And it also gives them um, agency. It also gives them a, an opportunity to become the leaders in these topics. So as we're going through this, uh, this will take us to learning the math because the math will not come in an isolated unit. 
it's really important to have the students understand as well that everything we're learning in math can be applied to our social justice. So it's very, um, how can I say, it's uh, much like we would say cross-curricular, this is what we're looking at in terms of social justice topics and their connections with math. Then, um, sorry, the chat's covering my next part. Um, the, the next part is understanding, here we go, introducing the topic to the students and having them research. So I'm just gonna reflect back to the material that I added with the TikTok. Again, the questions are very broad, they're big ideas. And the idea is to guide students through their learning, but really to allow them to engage with the material. And then this can foster our students to then not only just learn about the material, but then how can we use this to start changing the world? And that's what is the um, where I have here written reading and writing the world. And then, of course, we start the cycle all over again. And it might be with the same topic, but expanding our thought process or it could be on a new theme completely. But it's this is just a, an introduction of how we can start. Uh, the discussion of social justice and mathematics. Great, thanks Debbie. Um, and just to finish off, we have Jessica's framework as well, and we have some other frameworks that we can share with you in a PDF that we'll uh, put up with this video, um, along with these various books as resources for teaching math through social justice. Um, and we can give you some of the titles for these as a way to kind of think more about and read about um, like the weapons of math destruction is an excellent book and so is indigenous statistics as a way of thinking about asking different kinds of questions. Um, so these are resources that we will uh, make available to you. And, um, but before we, we have a few minutes, maybe for a couple of questions, I'll stop sharing and see if there's anybody who might like to unmute and ask a question or to put a question in the chat. Um, we might, we have time for make two <laughs> questions and then otherwise the video and the materials will be available to you at the Edith Lando uh, website where you registered for this session within a week or so. Anybody have any questions that you'd like to ask the presenters or uh, our statement that you, something that uh, spoke to you or that you noticed? Sorry, I wasn't even looking at the chat. Maybe there's something there. Um, maybe I could ask one of the presenters, like uh, Mahima, thinking about working at the kindergarten level. Um, what did you find most challenging for working with little ones on thinking about uh, teaching math for social justice? Um, I think what was challenging was maybe just, um, actually, you know, there was a lot of possibilities. I'm not sure if it was particularly as challenging as I really expected it to be. I found that, you know, once the students were really interested in it, and I kind of got open-minded about their suggestions, you know, well, well, why, why can't we be the ones who paint the spot? Like, why can't we be the ones who just um, decide that that's accessible? Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of possibilities if if you can be open minded and kind of um, take the students direction. I think one challenge was maybe kind of, um, you know, everybody has a varied understanding um, and like that's there's a real range, you know, in terms of um, some students really understood ac accessibility as, you know, everybody can fully participate, everybody can be fully included. And of course, some children had more simple understandings like um, anyone who moves different can come here. So, you know, I guess it's not necessarily a challenge, but you will find a range of understandings. But I think that's positive in that those understandings support each other um, as students discuss with one another. Great. Thank you, Mahima. I noticed that Tanalus is, has a hand raised. Danalus. Uh, Mo, Danalus, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed, I forgot the, I'm not good with names. The lady that just presented, um, my question Debbie? was, um, uh, I'm not on TikTok. I chose not to go on there because I've just 
um, being a student, I just don't have the time. And yet sometimes I do find myself um, browsing through Facebook, but um, is there another way to get onto your um, program without going on TikTok? And then I wanted to also comment, I was listening to the radio the other day and um, um, they were talking about, they asked, um, did you guys notice that um, songs are getting shorter and shorter? And the, um, the fellow was saying that um, he has a theory, the reason why songs are getting shorter and he says that TikTok has a lot to do with it. <laughs> Just throwing it interesting. Out. Thank um, you for your question. Debbie, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually, when I videoed these, I first uploaded them to just a private or semi-private YouTube um, because I wasn't quite sure. So I only participated in TikTok because I wanted to see what my kids were doing is actually how this whole thing started. And I wanted to find out, okay, well, what's what's the the big deal about this? And then like you were just saying about this, uh, the songs getting shorter, what I also noticed is that students' attention spans are getting shorter. So I was trying to find where is that hook of how I can do this. And TikTok was one where, I mean, once I created one video, it was really quite easy to upload to one place or the other. But I did YouTube or you could share this anyway, but it's definitely um, something that I found. I tried to find something that the kids would connect with. And so whatever that is within your community. So if it's not TikTok, then what are they looking at, right? And um, like, I know kids are talking about Discord right now. Well, I'm like, well, can I do this with Discord? And I have them teach me. And that's the biggest thing. And I'm, they're like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, okay, thanks. That's the end of that conversation. And so then we go to the next thing, right? But I definitely ask students what medium that I should be using right now. Cause, and then they teach me. And that's been the best thing that I could have ever done because then they're all like, oh, what are you doing now? And that could be my hook too, <laughs> is just having them teach me. So. Thank you, Debbie. Um, maybe we have time for one more quick question or a comment. I see people writing some things that stood out for them for the session. Thank you for that. That's helpful for the presenters. And for some of our presenters, this is their first time presenting in this kind of a format. So I'm really thankful and appreciate um, the time that you took to get ready for this and and I know it um, can be nervous you know even even in this environment it can you can get sweaty palms <laughs> so we want to recognize that people took a lot of time to prepare for, for us for today um, but if there are no further comments maybe we'll have time to if anybody has anything else no okay so I want to thank everybody then for attending, participating, and thinking about this really important topic of teaching math for social and ecological justice, to know that this is a, a work in progress, that um, just, just that the fact that you're here uh, is an indication that you're, you're think, just thinking about it and being here is the first step. So I hope that you're able to try some of these ideas out in your classroom. You can connect with any of the presenters. We'll put all that information on the, uh, the website where this video will be found in a week or so. And um, we'll try to keep the conversation going. So thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of the evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank you. for joining us, everyone.